So thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to kind of be here virtually um, with you all um, and to have this opportunity um, to share um, my work. Um, and um, as Rosamund mentioned, today's talk is going to be focused on uh, the book um, that I recently uh, published um, last September um, with Oxford University Press, um, Reds and Blue. Yeah, so this is based on my book. Um, which, um, as Rosamund mentioned, you know, and it is in the title, um, is focused on Soviet participation in the United Nations Educational, Scientific, um, and Cultural Organization, um, also known as UNESCO, um, during kind of the first half of the Cold War. Um, so chronologically, from about 1945, 1946, um, when UNESCO was created, along with the rest of the UN system, um, until the eve of detente um, in 1967. Um, so kind of going through the late Stalinist period, um, the Khrushchev period, um, and then like the early sort of Brezhnev um, era, although mainly focused on kind of late Stalinism um, and the thaw sort of de-Stalinization um, period up until 1964. Um, and I do this, I focus on UNESCO um, to kind of ask a major question question that I think has been to a certain extent um, overlooked in the historiography of Soviet foreign relations in particular. Um, and that is, what was the kind of popular reception um, of the idea of world governance um, in the Soviet Union, um, not just among the diplomatic corps, um, but also among kind of what you might call everyday people? Um, a small group of everyday people, um, as I'll talk about, the Soviet intelligentsia or white collar professionals, um, a privileged group um, of Soviet people, um, but beyond kind of the traditional diplomatic core. Um, and so I want to understand kind of Soviet reception of the idea of world governance um, in the UN system um, and in non-communist international organizations. Um, so kind of focusing on um, how Soviet citizens um, received the idea of world governance um, as it was kind of implemented um, at mid-century um, in the United Nations and in kind of non-communist international organizations um, in general. Um, so chronologically, as I mentioned, from 1945 to about 1967, um, before the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953, um, the USSR had at best, um, an ambivalent relationship with the UN system um, and with non-communist international organizations. Um, although it had helped found the United Nations in the sort of toward the end of the war, um, it opposed making the world body much more than a coalition of the great powers um, that had emerged as victors from the war. Um, it refused to join UNESCO um, and did not join many other major UN agencies beyond the Security Council um, in General Assembly. Um, in these early years of the Cold War before Stalin's death, the Soviet state accused UNESCO in particular of spreading a cosmopolitan ideology. Um, and this was an epithet, epithet drawn from the xenophobic and anti-Semitic campaigns inside the Soviet Union um, that coincided with uh, the ratcheting up of Cold War tensions in the late 1940s. After Stalin's death, however, um, the new Soviet leadership joined UNESCO and a number of other international organizations uh, that it was not member to in 1953. Um, this included the International Labor Organization, or ILO, um, and then it rejoined uh, the World Health Organization as well. Um, it also would join the Interparliamentary Union, um, and several other organizations that had long boycotted. Um, so my book sort of focuses on this reversal, um, beginning with the boycott from 1945 to 1953, and then this kind of major change in Soviet foreign policy um, after Stalin's death. Uh, if you could hit the next slide. Thank you. So the way that I go about this um, is I kind of see my book as putting into conversation um, two different historiographies um, that have not kind of always been in direct communication with each other. Um, so on the one hand, um, 
over the last 20 years, um, there's been a new kind of historiography of the United Nations um, and the United Nations in the Cold War, right? Um, so kind of situating the UN um, in global history, um, not treating it as just a sort of venue for, you know, diplomatic history, um, but trying to understand its intellectual origins um, and sort of the dynamics in world history that sort of shaped the UN. Um, so that's one historiography. The other historiography is kind of Soviet domestic historiography. Um, so uh, studies of the Soviet Union um, and the experience of the Soviet project um, by citizens. Um, so I see myself as putting kind of Soviet historiography um, and new histories of the United Nations during the Cold War, but also in the 20th century broadly, kind of into conversation with each other um, and building on scholars who have begun to do this, um, but kind of taking it, I think, a little bit further in some ways, at least with respect to UNESCO. Um, I do this um, to reassess kind of two general overarching um, aspects of how Soviet partition participation in the UN has kind of been portrayed, um, both in kind of traditional diplomatic history um, and kind of popularly. Um, so first it seeks to kind of complicate the betrayal of the Soviet Union um, as simply a spoiler of the UN idea um, as kind of these rigid ideologues who, because they were against the idea of world government or a world state, um, just sort of obstructed the UN. Right, which I think is kind of in a lot of literature, particularly um, before about 2010, 2011. Um, of course, the USSR did reject the idea of a world state, right? Um, as did many in the West. Um, but what I emphasize is this does not mean that Soviet citizens rejected kind of the real existing world governance um, as it existed um, in the UN. Um, and I'm sort of inspired here by Glenda Sluga's kind of characterization of kind of internationalism as this kind of real internationalism um, as it existed in the 20th century rather than as the idea, right, as it was implemented. Um, second, I reassess um, a kind of shared discourse of failure the UN and the USSR both share. Um, the UN um, is often portrayed as an institution that does not live up to its ideals, right? Um, one that never lived up to the kind of founding kind of aspirations of it, right? Um, and the new historiography of the UN kind of challenges this, right? Um, and in the USSR, there is also this idea um, that it was a failed utopian project, right? Um, it never lived up to its ideas um, and it is this failed utopian project. So this is kind of a similarity um, that I see. But instead of taking this kind of shared discourse of failure for granted, um, I find this discourse revealing about how the United Nations and the USSR interacted um, and how Soviet citizens understood and experienced the United Nations. So a recent direction in both the historiographies of the USSR and the UN is to get away from focusing on these institutions' ineptitudes and instead understand how people found meaning in them. Um, and one thing that both literatures conclude is that the USSR and the UN not only share a discourse of failure, but also a discourse of hope for a better world. Put differently, the Soviet Union and the United Nations were both the real existing versions of internationalist utopias of the early 20th century. Um, so they are disappointing attempts to realize utopia, to be sure, but they are also inspirations for realizing utopias in the future. Um, and in this respect, they share a common utopian impulse, to quote Mark Steinberg, um, a historian of Russia, um, that made the UN a logical part of post-Stalinist Soviet internationalism. The UN and the USSR had much in common in what they offered people. They were both enlightenment projects with claims to universality. They sought to forge international community and to mobilize this international community to international civic action to make a better world. As a result of these overlapping aspirations, um, I conclude that the UN became an important part of Soviet internationalist expression after Stalin's death and throughout much of the Cold War. Um, so this is kind of the main claim of the book and this is what I seek to show, um, that there existed a Soviet group of one-worlders, uh, to use a phrase that is often 
assigned to Western supporters of the UN, um, who found meaning and inspiration in kind of the everyday practices of the United Nations. Um, so I'm trying to kind of introduce Soviet citizens into uh, a lot of the new literature on the history of the UN um, by drawing on their experience um, in UNESCO. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just kind of give an overview of uh, my talk today. Um, I'm going to structure it the way that I structure my book. Um, part one of my book is a chronological history of Soviet participation in UNESCO um, from the organization's founding um, in 1945 um, to the late 1960s um, and kind of the beginning of detente, right? So kind of the first half of the Cold War. Um, and then part two of my book and uh, today's talk, um, I'm going to talk about and give some examples of these practices of everyday world governance, um, giving kind of three examples um, of this practice of everyday world governance. A lot of it's centered um, in Paris, which is where UNESCO's headquarters was. Um, I have up here um, a picture of Soviet students um, looking at a miniature model of the new UNESCO headquarters in the 1950s. Um, which today is not far from the Eiffel Tower um, in downtown Paris. Uh, next slide, please. So to start, um, Soviet-UNESCO relations from 45 um, to 67. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, um, before Stalin's death, um, the Soviet Union essentially boycotted UNESCO um, and refused to join it. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, a kind of general skepticism, as I mentioned, of making the UN into much more um, than sort of a security organization. Um, but also what I try to show is that there was a deeper kind of reason for this in kind of Soviet intellectual and cultural history of the time. Um, so this boycott I show can be explained by UNESCO's utopian aspirations to use education, science, and culture to build a better world, which Stalin viewed, um, or at least the Stalinist system and diplomats, it's hard to get kind of a read on what Stalin really thought, right? Um, viewed as a rival or competitor to the USSR's own utopian project to use knowledge to make a better world. In other words, it was because of the similarities between Soviet and UNESCO internationalisms, not so much their differences, that Stalin and the Stalinist system rejected UNESCO and wanted to limit the role of the United Nations. Both shared a utopian impulse to remake the world, and this made idealist visions of the UN a threat to the Soviet project. Stalin clearly favored limiting the UN to security-related matters. This conception of the UN was in the spirit of 19th century congresses among the great powers of Europe. And this is what the Security Council was created to do, especially with the veto system, right, as a sort of way to prevent any kind of majoritarian rule. Um, but the problem was that many in the West wanted the United Nations to be more than traditional great power diplomacy. These one worlders wanted it to become some kind of world government and for the UN to radically remake world order into a unified world society. UNESCO brimmed with these one worlders, functioning as a kind of ministry of education of the UN world government it became a purveyor of propaganda for one world and at times for even a world state, depending on who you asked who was sort of involved in UNESCO. So among supporters of a possible world state in the future and world society um, was the organization's first leader or director general, the British scientist Julian Huxley. In 1946, shortly after UNESCO's creation, Huxley wrote a book outlining what he called a philosophy for UNESCO uh, called Scientific World Humanism. This philosophy assigned UNESCO the role of collecting the world's knowledge into what he called a unified pool of tradition. By doing so, Huxley, Huxley hoped the organization would lay the foundation for a future global community um, and at some point possibly a world government. As a result, the USSR and its allies harshly criticized UNESCO as a form of bourgeois idealism. Indeed, the organization became a target of propaganda during the Soviet anti-cosmopolitan campaign of the late 1940s, which went after members of the Soviet intelligentsia, and Jews in particular, 
for international connections and perceived disloyalty um, to the United Nations or to the Soviet Union. Um, so to give you an example, um, the Soviet Union was not involved in UNESCO during this period, um, but one of the few communist states that was in the late 1940s was Yugoslavia. Um, and this is a quote from the Yugoslav delegate um, to UNESCO um, at the first general conference in 1946, Vladislav Ridnikar, pictured here, um, who criticized Huxley's proposed philosophy for UNESCO, which never became a philosophy for UNESCO, um, but was sort of indicative of kind of the implicit aspirations of the organization, um, especially in its early years. Um, so he wrote, in the case of the United Nations, is it possible to proclaim as official a speculative philosophy which in meetings and commissions would amount to a kind of philosophic Esperanto, referring to the artificial language um, Esperanto, and accordingly not to admit or even to reject from the cultural sphere dialectical materialism or Marxism-Leninism, a philosophy which has become the outlook of millions of men of all countries precisely because it is confirmed by experience, right? So criticizing these kind of ideas of turning the UN um, into something more um, and using UNESCO as a main kind of vehicle um, for doing that. Uh, next slide, please. So the Soviet Union boycotted um, UNESCO in its early years, right? Um, and this led to what I call a kind of dual power situation um, in world governance. Um, and this phrase um, is familiar to probably historians of Russia and the Soviet Union, right? Um, it's a reference to um, the situation of dual power that emerged in 1917 after uh Tsar Nicholas II abdicated his throne um, during the February Revolution. Um, so in 1917, in the kind of uh, void, the power vacuum that was created by the Tsar's abdication, um, two kind of centers of power emerged in Petrograd during the war, right? Um, the provisional government, which was the official kind of caretaker government of Russia um, in the what was the Russian Empire, um, and the Soviet, which was much more radical um, you know, represented workers and socialists of different stripes, right? And there was this kind of unsteady dual power situation that emerged. Um, and of course, eventually the provisional government would be overthrown by the Bolsheviks in the October Revolution. Um, so I'm kind of thinking in this vein um, when I think about how the Soviet Union viewed the UN um, under Stalin um, and kind of viewed itself as an alternative right, as an alternative center of internationalism um, and of possible world governance, right? Um, so the cartoon on the left I found in Pravda, the main party newspaper of the Soviet Union, um, criticizing UNESCO. Um, the, the, the cartoon portrays a rodent, looks like a rat, right, um, crawling through um, a manhole that has UNESCO written on it, um, the rodent is, you know, fascistic. It has like a Franco, Franco written on a holster, right? It has a swastika on it. Um, and it's peering through the acronym for the UN in Russian, right? Um, so, you know, the idea is that UNESCO is this, far from being this kind of utopian project, it's actually a dystopian plot for global domination um, of America, but also kind of fascistic pestilence that exists in the West. Um, in the early post-war period, right? So a rejection of the legitimacy of the UN um, as the seat of world governance. Um, and, you know, particularly after 1950, when the Soviet Union leaves even the Security Council, um, this is a moment where the Soviet Union is very much rejecting the UN um, in very many ways, despite its participation on and off um, in the 1940s. At the same time, the Soviet Union launched an alternative kind of internationalist movement, a very well-known peace movement um, that consisted of peace congresses um, and also was led by a world Soviet, um, sort of an international Soviet of peace um, or council of peace, right, in Russian. Um, one of the first major events of this alternative movement for kind of world governance and international civic action um, was the Vratslav Congress um, of Intellectuals um, for Peace um, in 1948. Um, and this kind of dual power situation manifested um, in 
uh, the Vratslav Congress, uh, when the UNESCO Director General, Julian Huxley, went there himself um, and was one of the five presidents of the Congress. Um, despite kind of the friendly looking interaction of Ilya Ehrenberg, Soviet writer, um, and Huxley in this picture, um, the Congress was actually a very kind of tumultuous, antagonistic affair um, in which Ilya Ehrenberg attacked um, the West, um, you know, kind of standard Cold War Marxist phrases were used to attack the West, um, and Huxley refused to sign the final communique or statement of the Congress um, because it was so political, right? Um, so this dual power kind of situation is very much uh, personified in the interactions um, of this Congress, um, as I show um, in my book. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So after uh, 1953, um, this all changes, right? With so many other things in the Soviet system, Stalin's death leads to um, major, major change, both internationally um, and domestically. Um, with regard to the UN, um, the Soviet Union um, essentially, you know, really changes um, how it treats the specialized agencies. Um, in 1954, uh, it joins the International Labor Organization. Um, it also joins UNESCO. Um, in 1955, it'll join the Inter-Parliamentary uh, Union, right? And it'll rejoin um, several other organizations. Um, some of it will still boycott up until the 1980s um, and the end of the Soviet Union. Um, but there's a major kind of change um, that takes place um, in 1954. So what I argue is that this was a major event in the history of Soviet and Russian foreign policy um, and their international relations. It marked a major, major change in Soviet thinking about non-communist international organizations and world governance. To go back to the dual power analogy um, from the late Stalin period, it would be as if the Bolsheviks had decided to participate in the provisional government back in 1917. It would have lent legitimacy to this government and a willingness to work within the system rather than just outside as a revolutionary disruptor, right? So this is essentially uh, the Soviet Union kind of coming in to a government that it had viewed as delegitimate or illegitimate. So I argue that the Soviet decision to embrace the UN system after 1953 lent the UN system legitimacy as the preeminent venue for world governance and international organization. It partially, at least, de-revolutionized Soviet socialist internationalism, making it a kind of parliamentary, evolutionary socialism within the United Nations, um, or what is also often been called the Parliament of Man, right, to, po to quote uh, Paul Kennedy's history um, of the UN. But this decision to join UNESCO also reflected fundamental convergences between Soviet intellectual life after Stalin's death um, and UNESCO's brand of internationalism. These convergences made the Soviet embrace of UNESCO not just possible, but logical. In particular, new framings of Soviet education, science, and culture as having emancipatory potential made post-Stalinist post Soviet intellectual life more responsive to UNESCO's premise that intellectual exchange could serve a global public good. Post-Stalinist Soviet internationalism and UNESCO were both based on the notion that education, science, and culture uh, were tools for building a better world. In the 1950s, Soviet and UNESCO internationalisms thus harmonized over a shared utopian impulse to universal enlightenment, right? So there's this kind of convergence in kind of how education, science, and culture are viewed internationally um, and their potential as kind of enlightenment or civilizing missions. Um, this was always within the UN and always within the Soviet project, um, but there's a kind of rejuvenation of the Soviet project and its internationalism in the 1950s. Um, and this is really well represented, I think, in these two photos, just to give some examples. Um, one of the first things the Soviet Union did when it joined UNESCO in April 1954 um, was to attend the Hague uh, conference that would lead to the Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict. Um, so a major treaty to protect cultural property um, during war. Um, this is a picture of the Soviet ambassador to France signing um, the convention 
Um, and then about a decade later, um, the famous cosmonaut uh, Yuri Gagarin during his visit to UNESCO um, in 1963, right? So personifying Soviet science um, and the potential of Soviet science um, to kind of lead humanity into the future, right? Utopianism um, through science. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. This shared uh, kind of vision of the world very much, um, at least in theory, um, would continue into the 1960s. And although I don't focus on the 1970s, pretty sure it would continue into the 70s and 80s um, with probably some bumps, right? Um, this was especially the case um, after decolonization really picked up in the early 1960s, um, after the so-called year of Africa in 1960. Um, when the UN really, really turned towards giving aid um, and technical assistance um, to what the Soviet Union called weakly developed countries, right? The, the third world, the non-aligned countries, um, but also non-European, non-Western um, countries. Um, the Soviet Union often criticized UNESCO for its approach um, to giving aid to weakly developed countries. Um, it viewed UNESCO as engaging in a kind of neo-colonialist plot um, to reinforce French um, and English and American hegemony internationally. Um, but at the same time, it also took part in this. Um, and to give you an example of one of its most successful uh, sort of projects, um, the Soviet Union helped build um, the uh, Bombay Institute of Technology um, in Bombay, India, um, and this began in the 1950s, but would go um, into the 1960s. And you can see on the left here, um, a picture of the Bombay Institute of Technology, um, where Soviet faculty would also work, right? Um, so this is a major contribution and shows how UNESCO and the Soviet Union both valued um, education and educational aid um, as something that could help humanity, right? Um, globally, um, increasingly, rather than just sort of within Europe um, and the so-called West. Um, however, um, the Soviet Union had issues with how UNESCO uh, conducted this. Um, it, it became particularly worried in the 1960s that the United States was plotting to co-opt UNESCO um, and use it for American foreign policy interests. Um, and this is because the Kennedy administration um, really became invested in educational aid in the context of the Cold War. Um, it sought to convince UNESCO uh, to use Peace Corps volunteers. Um, the Kennedy administration created a Peace Corps of young people who would go out through the world um, and kind of represent America. Um, and they sought to get UNESCO to kind of use uh, these volunteers um, internationally. Um, when this didn't quite work out the way the Kennedy administration wanted, um, the Kennedy administration also thought about kind of undermining UNESCO's power by taking science out of UNESCO. Um, and moving it to another international organization um, or focusing just on bilateral aid. Um, and once this happened, the Soviet Union found itself defending UNESCO um, from American attempts to undermine UNESCO's centrality um, as a space for international educational assistance and particularly scientific um, cooperation. Um, so the concluding part of my work on the kind of chronological aspect talks about how the Soviet Union had gone from boycotting UNESCO um, to viewing it as kind of its best bet um, in the non-communist international organizational system. Um, I have documents in which Soviet citizens and diplomats say over and over, our, our strongest presence is at UNESCO, right? This is where we have our strongest showing. Um, and so it's really important to prevent the Americans um, from undermining it. And in fact, they want to undermine it because we have such a strong presence um, in UNESCO and in UNESCO's kind of scientific um, activities. And on the right here, you can see a picture of President Kennedy um, with uh, the Director General of UNESCO in the, in the center um, and the U.S. Ambassador to UNESCO um, in 1963, October 1963. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the chronological kind of gist of the first part of my book. Um, the second part looks at Soviet citizens' participation um, in UNESCO and everyday world governance. 
Um, and this is what I'm really interested in, more so than the kind of chronological history. Um, I, I am interested in how Soviet citizens experienced UNESCO um, and what I call the three publics, international publics um, that UNESCO created. Um, first, the International Public Civil Service, so working in UNESCO's bureaucracy um, or secretariat. Second, an international public sphere of events. Um, and third, an international reading public um, of UN publications. Um, so these are the three that I sort of focus on. And I just want to give you three brief examples um, of these ways um, that Soviet citizens um, participated um, in UNESCO. Next slide, please. So I start this section off um, by looking at the experience of Soviet international civil servants um, in the UNESCO secretariat um, or bureaucracy. Um, and this is a picture of the UNESCO elevators um, in the 1950s um, of UNESCO secretariat workers. Um, I'm not sure where they're from, but I think it's kind of indicative of sort of the bureaucratic culture um, that I'll talk about. Um, so starting the section off with the bureaucracy, um, I look at the experience of Soviet diplomats, teachers, librarians, scientists, and other white collar professionals who went to work in the internationally staffed UNESCO secretariat um, or the organization's bureaucracy at UNESCO headquarters in Paris, France in the 1950s and 60s. So one of the key objectives of my book is to situate international organizations um, and UNESCO in particular in the domestic cultural, intellectual, social, and economic realities of both European and Soviet life in the post-war era. I portray UNESCO not as simply a site of international relations, but as grounded in the domestic realities of the period. Um, in short, I seek to write a kind of socio-cultural history of Soviet participation in UNESCO. In the case of the organization's international civil service, I show that the experiences of Soviet citizens who went to work for UNESCO were shaped by the cultural and social milieus of both the mid-century West and their Soviet homeland. In particular, Soviet international civil servants experienced in their jobs at UNESCO widespread anxieties over bureaucratic, bureaucratic conformity um, and alienation. In the 1950s, such anxieties were transsystemic pervasive in the West um, and the communist East, and reflected a cultural moment in which there was a search for authenticity in both the East and the West. In the West, fears over bureaucratic conformity and alienation were reflected in many cultural and scholarly works of the time. In the American context, to name just a few examples, there was the novel, The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, the famous phonies criticized by Holden Caulfield in The Catcher in the Rye, um, and sociological works like The Organization Man by William White or One Dimensional Man by Herbert Marcuse. Such anxieties were also pervasive in the post-war Soviet Union, uh, where Stalinist bureaucracy was thought to have ruined the Soviet utopian project. After Stalin's death, many books and articles critiqued bureaucratism in the USSR and called for sincerity and a rejuvenation of an authentic communist project. So these fears about bureaucracy, I argue, are central to understanding the Soviet experience of the international civil service. While both UNESCO's brand of internationalism and Soviet internationalism had converging, converging utopian ideals to remake the world through enlightenment, these utopias were also seen as being undermined by the same phenomenon modern bureaucracy. Soviet international civil servants understood the UNESCO bureaucracy they worked in through the lens of criticisms of bureaucracy back in their Soviet homeland, where bureaucracy was seen as an obstacle, as an obstacle to achieving communism. Right? And Khrushchev launched a war on bureaucracy um, in the 1950s. But this participation, or this perception, sorry, of the UN as being undermined by bureaucracy did not mean Soviet international civil servants rejected the UN idea of world governance. Rather, they positioned themselves as fighting the UNESCO bureaucracy and working for an authentic utopian idea that UNESCO and the USSR shared. In their minds, the UNESCO bureaucracy and their Western coworkers in it were the ones who were undermining the UN idea, not necessarily just the Soviet state. <clears throat> 
And so when they went to work for UNESCO, Soviet international civil servants viewed themselves as upholding both Soviet ideals and UN ideals of making a better world and solving the divisions of the Cold War. Next slide, please. So to give just one example um, of a Soviet citizen who went to work for UNESCO, criticized its bureaucracy, um, but at the same time sought to work for the UN idea, and it seems from what she wrote back to the USSR, really believed that she was serving um, Soviet ideas um, and UN ideas. Um, A.K. Zhegolova, um, who was a diplomat, um, but also had a history as a teacher, um, she went to work for the UNESCO Secretariat um, from about 1956 to 1960, kind of late 1959 into 1960, um, and worked in UNESCO's Department of Education, overseeing um, secondary education um, and kind of the dissemination of materials um, internationally about secondary education, as well as UNESCO uh, programs for international understanding and curricula for international understanding. Um, to secondary uh, schools internationally. Um, so that was kind of her official position in the UNESCO Secretariat. Um, but she also became um, a leader in women's rights and speaking on kind of what the male-dominated UNESCO called in the 1950s women's issues um, in the UN. Um, she became the unofficial point person for these women's issues um, in UNESCO um, and ended up representing UNESCO at the UN Commission on the Status of Women um, two times, once in New York, um, when the UNCSW, the Commission on the Status of Women, met in New York, um, and then again um, in Geneva um, later on. Um, and according uh, to um, UNESCO and the, the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, um, Zhegolova was actually the first Soviet citizen to represent a non-communist international organization at the proceedings of another non-communist international organization. Um, so she was kind of forced to represent UNESCO instead of the Soviet Union um, in the bureaucracy um, and therefore work for UNESCO ideas um, and not just Soviet ideas, although she sought to work for these also and to reconcile her role as a Soviet citizen um, with her role as an international civil servant. Um, and this is a picture of her um, with the representative to the international of the International Labor Organization to the UNCSW on the left, um, and a picture of her um, with Swedish diplomat Agda Russell um, and Pakistani uh, chairwoman of the UNCSW uh, Begin Anwar Ahmed um, in 1959. Um, so you know she is a one example of how uh, Soviet citizens both could work for Soviet ideas of peace and a better world. Um, but also UN ideas um, at the same time. Um, although she also wrote home about how terrible the UNESCO bureaucracy was, how her American boss ran it like, in a, like a corporate, American corporate machine. Um, so she viewed herself as very much kind of working in spite of the UNESCO bureaucracy for a better world, which is reminiscent of how Soviet citizens viewed themselves at home fighting bureaucracy uh, to achieve a kind of communist idea. Right, so these converging internationalist utopias. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so that's kind of the first part of uh, the second part of my book. Um, and then I go on to talk about kind of the many, many uh, UNESCO events um, and Soviet participation in UNESCO events. Um, these were conferences, symposia, um, on any issue related to education, science, and culture. Um, so Soviet white collar professionals participated in conferences on early computer science, on museum studies, um, on librarianship, um, on biology, right? Just anything you can imagine that's educational, scientific, or cultural, UNESCO had an event um, and Soviet citizens did their best um, to show up, although they didn't make everything uh, much to the chagrin um, of Soviet um, authorities. These made up what I call the Soviet or the UNESCO international public sphere, um, in which Soviet citizens use their expertise as scientists, as librarians, um, to collaborate internationally to make a better world um, and to fulfill both Soviet foreign policy interests of representing the Soviet Union at these events, 
um, but also UN ideas, right? That the, you could do both at the same time. Um, and Soviet citizens did um, at many of these events. There are so many of these events um, that I don't cover, you know, even a fraction of them um, in my book. Um, I focus on a couple of examples. Um, and I thought one that I'd spotlight um, in my talk today um, is this, uh, it's a symposium or a kind of round table um, to commemorate the 700th uh, anniversary um, of the birth of Dante, uh, Dante Alighieri, the writer of um, the Divine Comedy um, and most famously the Inferno. Um, and you can see pictured here, um, various kind of luminaries um, who were invited in 1965 um, to a round table to commemorate um, Dante's birth. This is obviously, I think, it's hard to know what copy, um, but a copy of Dante's um, Divine Comedy, probably like an old original or one that's very old or important. Um, and seated here, um, you can see Ilya Ehrenberg. Um, he's sort of third from left um, in discussion with uh, Montali, um, the... Italian would-be Nobel laureate, the poet. Um, and so Ilya Ehrenberg goes to this um, and he praises UNESCO's role in kind of, you know, bringing in a world culture. He praises Dante's role in this um, after having been the representative of an alternative movement um, to UNESCO only 20 years beforehand, right? So he sort of embodies and personifies the change in Soviet internationalism from the boycott under late Stalin during the late Stalinist period um, to the 1960s. The fact that he would go to this event and participate um, and praise Dante as kind of a representative of world culture um, is, you know, a representative of how much Soviet policy had come since the death of Stalin. You can also see up here um, uh, a famous American literary critic, um, uh, uh, Mary McCarthy. Um, and the director general, as well as several other sort of luminaries at UNESCO um, in 1965. Next slide, please. So that's the kind of international public sphere. Um, the last part of my book um, looks at what I call the international reading public um, created by UN publications um, and UNESCO publications in particular um, inside the Soviet Union. Um, and I focus on one magazine in particular that UNESCO published called the UNESCO Courier, um, which was a popular magazine, um, sort of like uh, the American Life magazine um, in kind of its aesthetics um, that UNESCO published and translated into the world's major languages. Um, and beginning in 1957, the Courier was translated um, into Russian and reprinted um, in the Soviet Union. Um, it quickly developed after 1957, a wide uh, readership, um, a small, um, but kind of diverse leadership, I, readership, I should say, um, among the kind of Soviet intelligentsia, um, students, um, various white collar professionals, um, the elderly pensioners were often described as the main um, sort of base um, of readership. Um, and it was a small readership, but it was a very diverse readership that spanned the Soviet Union. Um, and I look at um, the letters to the editor um, that Soviet citizens sent um, to see how Soviet citizens inside the USSR received the ideas of international community, um, international civic action, and world governance um, that the UNESCO Courier advocated. Um, the Courier was very much kind of a public relations tool of UNESCO. Um, that sought to both kind of spread knowledge, um, but also promote ideas of international community, international civic action, and world governance, right? It promoted the idea that the UN was a force for good. Um, it would have coverage of things like the UN campaign against malaria um, in the 1960s. Um, and so it was very much kind of a PR or even a propaganda tool um, of UNESCO. Um, and it was a rare foreign magazine to be translated into Russian and released um, in the Soviet Union. Um, the letters to the editor I've, are some of the most fascinating to me, at least sources that I found. Um, and what I argue is that they show that many Soviet citizens viewed the UN um, as a means of imagining and building, at least kind of in their minds, um, a better world. 
right? That world governance was actually something that inspired um, Soviet citizens inside the USSR who managed to get their hands um, on the Courier magazine. Um, and so to just give one example, um, this is a letter, um, a quote from a letter um, from a Muscovite, um, someone living in Moscow in 1957, um, who wrote to the UNESCO Courier um, advocating for the creation of international sound libraries um, all over the world um, as a way to improving uh, sort of the world through enlightenment, through culture, right? Um, but placing this responsibility on UNESCO, right? So using world governance as a means to make a better world. Um, so he wrote, the creation of free centers of universal literature accessible to millions of people would provide a rapid solution to the expenses of book publishing, um, international sa public sound libraries in each of the world's capitals. That should be a slogan for UNESCO, right? Um, so using UNESCO as a means to kind of create a better world, using culture as a kind of civilizing force to create um, a better world. So just to kind of uh, sum up, um, the role of the courier um, and UNESCO and the UN in general, um, most of the evidence I found would last until the end of the USSR. Um, Soviet citizens were still writing to the UNESCO courier in the late 1980s. Um, I found letters um, saying, you know, the Courier, I've been reading it for 25 years. Um, it has been an inspiration to me. Um, Soviet authorities during Glasnost and Perestroika um, said that it represented Gorbachev's new thinking. Um, and in many ways, uh, Gorbachev would embody kind of the fusion of Soviet and UN utopianism um, in the late 1980s. He would call for using the UN as a kind of central place to end the Cold War, um, and of his new thinking. Um, and he would also appeal to UNESCO several times um, to create a kind of council of intellectuals to solve the world's problems. He would do this after the collapse of the Soviet Union um, in his Manifesto for the Earth, which was a book he wrote in the mid 2000s. He would call for UNESCO to do this. Um, there's also a website that he created where he appealed to the UNESCO director general um, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014 um, to create kind of a council of elders or an intellectual council to solve the world's problems, right? Um, so he very much, Gorbachev, I think, embodies kind of what I kind of find happening much earlier um, in the Soviet Union. Um, he very much sort of represented this. So I conclude in my book um, that during the Cold War, the UN did much to preserve peace and the spirit to work collectively for a better world, um, no matter its policy failures, right? The policy failures are well known, the UN's ineptitude is well known, um, but it still was an important symbolic um, thing. And it was a place for all the nations of the world to gather to work for a better world, um, despite its problems. And I wanna conclude with a quote um, from Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who ruled the Soviet Union from 1953 about to 1964. Um, he wrote in his memoirs describing the UN, although the UN was, quote, like a cold cleansing shower in its ability to make people a bit more tolerant and a bit more realistic about the prevailing conditions in international affairs, the organization forced the enemies of the new system of the future, or communism, to choose between peaceful coexistence and a hopeless, bloodletting war that no one would win. In this way, he assessed, the international policies of all countries are like streams which flow into the enormous basin of the United Nations. Um, so for all of its problems, it is kind of the central place um, and it is an important tool of preventing war. Um, and Soviet citizens believe this um, and we're not just sort of cynical uh, sort of, you know, disruptors of the Soviet system. Um, so thank you very much. That's my, that's my talk.